was uh, quite an introduction. Thank you. <laughs> Firstly, I thought it was brilliant. <laughs> I don't know what you feel about my OCD, but I'm impressed. <laughs> uh, you know, you told a very funny story about what happened to you in the park. And I'd like to share with you an amusing story, maybe not as funny, but an amusing story that I heard from my dear friend, Ira Burko. Those of you who follow sports probably know the name Ira Burko. is a very famous New York Times sports writer. And Ira Burko was telling me the story about his assignment back in the mid-90s. Um, how many of you have heard of Michael Jordan, by the way? <laughs> okay, great. So you know the story. Ira Berko was sent by the New York Times to cover the NBA playoff series between the Chicago Bulls and the Cleveland Cavaliers. And uh, the game took place in Cleveland, Saturday night. Ira Berko arrived the day before the game. And because he had Michael Jordan's cell phone number and he knew him from before, he decided to call Michael Jordan and tell him, you know, I'm here in Cleveland. Uh, what are you doing tonight? Michael Jordan said, well, I have no special plans other than watching the other game in the series, uh, which was New York Knicks, Charlotte Hornets. At the time, uh, the Hornets were in Charlotte. Um, I'm going to watch this game on television in my room, and uh, you're more than welcome to join me. So Ira Berko said, uh, where are you staying? So I'm staying at the Ritz-Carlton in downtown Cleveland. The game begins at 8. So Ira Berko arrives at the hotel, he crosses the lobby, he runs right into the elevator, and he sees an elderly couple in the elevator with him. The man looked very familiar to him, but he didn't know who he was until the man opened his mouth. And then it clicked, he knew exactly who that man was. And then it just so happened that the couple left the elevator, got off the elevator on the same floor, it was the eighth floor of the Ritz Carlton in downtown Cleveland. And Ira Berko turned to the elderly couple and asked them the following. He said, excuse me, I really don't do those things usually, but I have to ask you, aren't you the famous Israeli diplomat Abba Ibn? Those of you who don't know, Abba Ibn was a South African-born Israeli minister of foreign affairs, ambassador to the UN, ambassador to the US a legend in Israeli diplomacy, and he had a very famous television series on PBS called Heritage, about the cradle of civilization in the Middle East. And the elderly man said, yes, I am. I am Abba Ibn, and this is my wife, Susie. And Ira Berko said, oh my God, you can't imagine. I'm Jewish, and I'm a big admirer of yours, and I'm so glad to, to <coughs> have met you. But I have to ask you, Ira Berko said, what are you doing in downtown Cleveland at this time of the, of the evening. Abba even said, well, you know, a very famous rabbi retired here in Cleveland. They asked me to come and be the keynote speaker at his retirement uh, event, the farewell party. So I just did that, and I, we're on our way back to our room, and uh, we're off back to Israel tomorrow. And what are you doing here? Abba Berko said, well, you know, I'm just on my way to uh, watch a basketball game with Michael Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> Silence. Abba Ibn is looking at his wife Susie. Susie is looking at Abba Ibn. And then Susie breaks the silence. Who is Michael Jordan? <laughs> Berko is amused. He says, oh, <laughs> my, Michael Jordan is probably the, the most recognized athlete in the world. Uh, he's a great uh, basketball legend, and I'm going to watch the game with him. So they wished him have an enjoyable evening, and they split. Berko walks towards uh, Jordan's room. He knocks on the door. Jordan opens the door. It's a true story. He says to him, Michael, you won't believe what just happened to me. So what happened to you? He said, well, I just met probably the only couple in the whole world that never heard of you. <laughs> <laughs> He said, really, who never heard of me? He said, well, Susie and Abba even, they never heard of you. <coughs> Silence. <laughs> Michael Jordan is looking at him and says, who's Abba even? <laughs> and of course, Ira Berko told him, well, Abba even is a famous Israeli diplomat. And Jordan replies, well, it's a good thing he didn't tell him who I was. Well, it's a good thing he didn't know who I was. He said, how come? He said, well, it's less one person to ask me for a ticket for tomorrow night's game. <laughs> but the reason why I'm telling you this story is because you probably noticed that 
it doesn't say nation branding there, but rather country positioning. And why are we engaged in this effort to improve our country's positioning or our place's positioning? The place can be, by the way, a city like Philadelphia, it can be a campus like UPenn or a specific department within the campus. A place has a DNA, a place has a personality just like a human being. And the same way we want to be able to relate and build relationships between you, human beings, we're also interested in building and creating relationships that are meaningful between places and human beings that marketing people and business people refer to usually as consumers. So what I'd like to do today is to address three things. The first is I'd like to speak in general about the whole idea of branding, of putting a human face on a, on a product or a place or, or a phenomenon, then I'd like to share with you a little bit about the case of Israel, what's unique about Israel's positioning, and what is it that we intend to do in order to improve that. So, you know, the first part will be a little academic, so forgive me because after all we are sitting in an academic institution. Uh, so what is really branding? You're looking at two products that essentially fulfill the same function. The only difference is that while this product costs, it's a Mont Blanc. How much do you think it goes retail? 370. 370 bucks. <laughs> okay, while the first product costs 370 bucks, this product you can actually get for free if you're staying at the Crown Plaza. <laughs> right? They, they fulfill exactly the same function. But the difference is that the producers and the designers and the manufacturers of this product were able to create such a compelling, attractive personality to this product that we're willing to pay that much money only to be associated with it. We could have had the same function for, for nothing, yet we chose to spend $370 to be associated with this thing. Well, there's a very famous sociologist that I hope that you study his work here at this school because I think it's extremely relevant uh, to the whole field of marketing. His name is Irving Goffman. How many of you heard of Irving Goffman? Very few? Okay, so let me tell. Uh, how many Canadians do we have in the room, by the way? Well, don't be afraid. <laughs> be proud. I had a meeting with the Canadian Council General yesterday, and we talked about Irving Goffman. Irving Goffman was a Canadian sociologist who in the 50s came up with the very, very influential theory known as the symbolic interaction theory. What is symbolic interaction theory? Goffman says every uh, human gesture symbolizes and signifies something. People always thrive to seek control over the other's perception of themselves and the way, to do, the way they do it is by using symbols. So for example, when I make a decision to buy a $370 Mont Blanc pen, I do it because I want to seek control over your perception of me. And I know what the, what the pen stands for. The pen has a certain personality. Now, if you, as the marketer, have the ability to decode and understand the meaning of every symbol, not only the cultural meaning, the political meaning of every symbol, then you have a very powerful tool in your hands. Let me give an example. In 2000, and four was a very interesting presidential campaign here between Kerry and Bush. I'm sure some of you remember that. Uh, one of the people that ran the Bush campaign, Bush, as you remember, won the elections. I believe his name was Mr. Pollock. He gave a speech after the elections, and then in the speech he said, we reached a point in which we were able to tell that if you're driving a Volvo, you're more likely to vote for Kerry if you're driving a BMW, you're more likely to vote for Bush. What they actually did, the people of the Bush campaign, they actually put Irving Goffman's theory to work. BMW has a certain personality as a brand. If you understand what it means, the meaning of that personality, you can actually predict behavior. And it's all about the ability to predict behavior. Uh, just one little piece of trivia, I don't know how many of you... By the way, Goffman is considered to be uh, the most important sociologist of the second half of the 20th century. 
And uh, he had one sister who died recently, whose name was Frances Bay. Those of you who are big fans of the show Seinfeld probably remember her. She was the Marvel Rye lady. She was an actress. Uh, how many of you recognize Frances Bay? That was Irving Goffman's sister. Just a piece of trivia. What is a brand? A brand is a promise. A strong brand is a promise delivered. What's Michael Jordan's promise? Michael Jordan is probably the strongest brand in sports history. What's his promise? Who can tell me? What's his promise? What? Who said championship? Exactly. His promise is to win. Michael Jordan is about winning. What happened in his career that made us understand that he's a unique winner, not just a regular winner. There were many winners in sports history. But what happened in Michael Jordan's career that stresses the point that Michael Jordan delivered on his promise in an unprecedented fashion? Who can tell me? What happened in his career? Six, six, what? Six championships. Six championships, but how? Two, three heats. What happened between them? He retired. Now you have to understand, guys, when you are a concert, a concert pianist, or when you are a professional golfer, or a professional tennis player, or a professional basketball player, and you decide to retire for two full seasons, you can never go back to where you were. It's against the rules of nature. You can never do that. Michael Jordan won three championships consecutive then retired for two seasons, came back, scored 55 points in his comeback game in Madison Square Garden. I know that, because I had tickets and I didn't go. <laughs> <laughs> and then he won three more championships. Michael Jordan did something no other athlete ever did. Came back from retirement and repeated three championships and then another three championships. His delivery on his promise was so spectacular that he earned his place in sports history as the most remarkable winner in history. Maybe Muhammad Ali was closer, a little bit closer to him, but he is unquestionably. Now, what's obviously the promise of the United States? And I have to tell you that in country positioning, the United States is in a league of its own. Every country aspires to be like the United States. Why? What's the promise the United States is making? Freedom. Freedom is the DNA of the United States. Now, the ability of the United States to deliver on this promise is so all-encompassing, is so total, that the United States is considered to be the strongest country brand in the whole world. And of course, Coca-Cola, a very powerful brand, What's the promise Coca-Cola is making? To be refreshing. If you drink Coca-Cola and you're still not refreshed and you feel thirsty, then the product failed. In their case, the product delivers on this uh, promise in a very big way. Now, branding is not just about the ability to create visual language. A lot of people think that's what we need to do. We need a bunch of designers that understand how to design a beautiful logo and come up with a couple of uh, interesting, compelling copyrights, that's not branding. Here's the story of Israel's number one bus company. It's called Eged. Eged owns 50,000 buses in Israel. A few years ago, someone said, someone on the board of Eged said, well, you know, the public is concerned with air pollution. Let's go green. So what did they do? They hired the designer who told them, no problem. You want to go green? Let's paint the buses in green. <laughs> and they did. Well, they forgot to do one little thing. They forgot to change the engine, change the technology. It's not just about you know, painting the buses in green. You actually have to support your bread promise with real action. There's another example coming from Israel that is a very compelling example, my hometown of Cholon. Cologne some 15 years ago suffered from a very bad image. Lots of crime, it's a blue color, boring suburb of Tel Aviv. Lots of problems, the education system was not so good and so on. 
And at one point, the city of Cholon elected a new mayor. And that mayor's name was Moti Sasson. <coughs> he said, I would like to be the center for children in Israel. But then instead of hiring a designer to design a beautiful logo for children, what he did very quietly for the next five years, he invested very heavily in citywide infrastructure to support his grand promise to cater for children. So he built a children's theater, he built a children's museum, a media center for children, he built a groundbreaking concept of no less than 27 uh, themed playgrounds for toddlers. In Hebrew it's called Gan Sipu, Gan Sipu. Themed playground for toddlers. Now imagine you have a, a classic book like The Given Tree, and you have a playground for toddlers, ages let's say two to four, <coughs> that is designed after the book. So the toddler thinks he's actually, he can relive the book. The book becomes a reality. And he built 27 of them. Unbelievable. Five years into the process, he didn't have to spend a penny on advertising because it became a well-known fact. Cholon is indeed Israel's city of children. That's branding. You have to be able to support your promise with real action. And we'll talk about some other examples later. Now, nations see themselves as brands too. Usually nations communicate their brand to the world through the classic channels of nation branding. Number one is foreign policy. Domestic policy. Media. What is America's number one branding agent? The most powerful agent the United States has. Who can tell me? Which one? TV. Yeah. TV. It's bigger than TV. What's bigger than TV? Movies. Entertainment. American entertainment industry is the number one branding agent the United States has. It's not just TV. It's music. It's Hollywood. Hollywood is so powerful that it, Hollywood has the ability to brand other countries. <laughs> Hollywood branded Paris as the world's capital of romance. Most recently, Hollywood branded Las Vegas. Hollywood branded Thailand. And I can go on and on and give you examples of movies that Hollywood produced. How many of you had seen the movie Vicky Cristina Barcelona? It's a wonderful movie that did great service to the city of Barcelona. It's a Woody Allen production. Now, in every nation branding or country positioning effort, the key is the ability to form partnerships. And I say this to you also, one day you will all go into business and you'll have to run big businesses. This is the key to be successful in business. The ability to form partnerships. Now in today's world, the non-governmental sector is playing a critical role. So for example, in the case of Israel's efforts to improve its positioning, we're working very closely with the Jewish establishment in North America. Why? Because not only because they have the resources, not only because they have the motivation, but mostly because they know what Israel is all about. Most Americans don't know what Israel is all about, then their knowledge of Israel comes from the news, and that's only one very narrow angle of Israel. So as I said before, every place has a personality, every place has a DNA. So when we think of Brazil, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Carnival. Carnival. What else? Samba, soccer, bikini, right? We think of bikini. We think that Brazil exists in our mind in a department that is what? In our brain, what's the compartment we find Brazil in? Uh, fun, wonderful. You've seen this presentation before. Brazil is about fun. Now, no offense to any Brazilians in the room, but you know that Brazil can be dangerous for tourists. It's probably one of the most dangerous places for tourists in the world. Brazil is fun, and unquestionably, there's a lot of fun in Brazil, but there are many Brazilians, for them life is far from being fun. Yet, with all of Brazil's problems, when we think of Brazil, we think of fun, and rightly so. In terms of country positioning, Brazil enjoys a very powerful position in which 
Brand Brazil is way up here, very powerful, very strong, very attractive. Brazil, the place, is very good, but is a little bit inferior to the brand. The gap between the two is worth billions of dollars to Brazil's economy, including hosting the Olympic Games and the Mondial in the next decade. In Israel's case, as you will see in a few minutes, we're in exactly the opposite situation. Where Israel, the place, is very attractive. Those of you who've been to Israel, how many of you have been to Israel, by the way? About 60%. So you know that Israel can be very attractive, but Israel's brand is so inferior to the product that the gap between them becomes not only an impediment, but actually a liability. And our job in the Israeli government, together with our friends in the Jewish community, is to slowly <coughs> close the gap. There were places that were able to do that. We'll talk about that. It usually happens within a generation or two. It's not something that happens overnight. It takes time. Country positioning takes a lot of time. And we'll talk about that. So we said Brazil is about fun. We already mentioned that Paris is about romance. New York City is about what? Who can tell me? It's a combination of two things. Excitement what? Excitement, bright lights, theater. Well, what's, what's the Big Apple? What does it mean? New York is first of all about size. Everything in New York is big. So it's not just an apple, it's the Big Apple. But the most important thing is, it's the big temptation. The apple is a very charged, religious symbol. It stands for temptation. And what New York is telling you, the New York experience is about the totality of life in New York. It's about the good and the bad. It's not just about Broadway. It's not just about Fashion Week. You have other things in New York. And you have to be aware of that. New York strategy is the big temptation, and New York is interested in building relationships with you where the ultimate level of relationship is love. Now, I know many Israelis that will tell you genuinely, I love New York, and they really mean it. They have a relationship with New York. They say, oh, New York, oh my god. Well, I do shopping only in New York. <laughs> but they can't do shopping in Israel. They have to come to New York to do shopping. All my, all my shoes I buy only in New York. I can't go, I can't think of any, oh, I have one restaurant in New York. You know, you know, that's, they have a relationship with New York, seriously. You find Israelis, they're crazy about New York. By the way, I love Philadelphia. <laughs> seriously, I have many friends here. Some of them are in the room. And of course, Las Vegas. Las Vegas is about what? Party. Sin. Sin is the DNA of Las Vegas. And the tagline is, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Now I'm asking you, what happened exactly in Vegas? <laughs> what happens in Vegas that has to stay in Vegas? What was it? My son's bar mitzvah? No, it wasn't like that. Something probably terribly bad happened in Vegas. I lost my apartment, I lost my car, my wife left me, I don't know what happened in Vegas. But whatever, whatever happened stays in Vegas. Don't worry about it. You can go home, everything's going to be okay. Now that's the power of Las Vegas branding. What they did is very, very bold in marketing terms. Imagine that Israel, during the high desert intifada, would come to you, the American people, with the following branding strategy. Come to Israel for an explosive vacation. <laughs> Can you imagine? That's what Las Vegas did. They took their number one liability, the concept of gambling as a sinful act. And they said, we're not only not going to shy away from it, we're actually going to celebrate it. This is going to be our brand. So you had a succession of movies from what happens in Vegas all the way to the hangover, that actually celebrate Las Vegas as a place where you're given, a very, very generously, a license to sit. Brilliant. So courageous. I think people should write books about it. <laughs> and of course, we set out to explore if Brazil is about fun and Las Vegas is about sin, then Israel is about what? 
Who wanted to know? The answer, of course, after the break. <laughs> now, nations can actively manage their brand. It's something that you can manage the same way that Mercedes-Benz is managing their brand. Countries like the United States, like Finland, like Croatia, like Australia, can actually manage their brand. And they can do it in a very effective way. How do you measure success if you're a nation? The first thing you want to do is to make sure that you conduct your ongoing independent research. That's the first thing that you have to do. Never rely on someone else to do the research for you. You have to hire the researchers yourself. So the first thing you want to do is to see if, the, if, your, if your performance is improving according to your own research. The second thing you want to do is measure the number of tourists that are coming to visit you. Whether you're Philadelphia or Israel, tourism is a huge indicator if you're doing well or not. The second, the third indicator would be foreign investment. How much money you're able to attract? <coughs> foreign money, money from the outside. Of course, another major parameter is the level of exposure of your cultural products. We have many cultural products in Israel. We have a thriving film industry, we have great theater, great music, great literature, great dance. We can actually measure how many people went to see the most recent entry that Israeli made to the Academy Awards, a movie called Footnote. We can actually measure that. How many tickets were sold in America? We can measure how many books Amos Oz was, really, was able to sell last year. We can actually measure how many Americans in Philadelphia came to listen to Dan Reichel when he came to perform here on campus. Those things can be measured. And of course, we wanted to see an increase in the export of goods and services from Israel to the world. And the most important thing is exchange. Student exchange, faculty exchange, tourist exchange, these are all measurements to do that. Now, one of the most compelling case studies in country positioning, which is a successful case study, many of them failed, is of course the story of Spain. This was Spain in the 70s. Industrial, the perception was that post Franco it was still not democratic. It was uh, uh, the underprivileged part of Southern Europe. And this is Spain today. Probably the number one tourist attraction in Europe, maybe second to France, maybe equal to France. It's a one long celebration of culture and architecture and design. Dynamic, young, modern, hip. <coughs> How did it happen? Well, the first thing that they did, they formed a partnership with the cultural establishment and with the private sector. The second thing that they did, they turned the emphasis into a cultural one. You can see this is the logo up there. What can you tell me about the logo on the upper left side of the screen? It's playful. It's Miro. Why, why did they choose Miro? By the way, the tagline that they chose back in 1982 was, everything under the sun. So they were celebrating diversity, the eclectic nature of Spain, and they were using a Spanish artist who's arguably not the most famous artist that was born in Spain. It was another artist, more famous than Miro, who was born in Spain. Pablo Picasso. But what was the difference between them? Where did Picasso spend most of his career? France. In France. So they were sending a very strong message. Miro is Spain because he never left Spain. More than any artist, made more than any other artist. And of course, you see, Santiago Calatrava was born in Valencia. He's building bridges all over the world. In fact, in Israel alone, we have two Calatrava bridges. So Spain is actually exporting its cultural icons now to the world. We have a wonderful Calatrava bridge in Jerusalem, and another one, a small Calatrava bridge in Petah Tikva, of all places. <laughs> <laughs> Croatia, 15 years ago, was associated with war and destruction and bloodshed. This is Croatia today, one of the most attractive destinations for tourism and investment 
in Europe. Now, and here I'm moving to talk about a little bit about Israel. Israel is a producer of bad news. We live in not the nicest neighborhood in the world. And bad things happen in our neighborhood. So we constantly appear in the news in negative contexts. And until recently, when I say recently, until eight, ten years ago, we didn't really do much beyond managing the crisis of the day. We did not make an attempt to manage Israel the same way you manage a brand. Whether your brand is called Estee Lauder, or Revlon, or uh, BMW. And when you do that, there is a danger. When crisis management becomes your prevailing mode of operation, there's a danger that others will look at you only in militaristic terms. I want you to see something. This is an excerpt from a speech made by JFK in 1961, in which he talks about Israel. Listen to what he says. Israel was not created in order to disappear. Israel will endure and flourish. It is the child of hope and the home of the brave. It can neither be broken by ad adversity nor demoralized by success. It carries the shield of democracy and it honors the sword of freedom. What's striking in this paragraph is that JFK chose to use military terminology <coughs> when he refers to Israel. Israel is a shield and a sword and at best a tiny infant that we have to protect. So the whole approach is militaristic and it's about the understanding of Israel within the equation of power. And to him, to President Kennedy, this was Israel's grand promise back in 1961. Well, one of the first things you do in terms of positioning is that you turn to your own stakeholders, the people that own the brand. And you ask them about their own perception of their brand. This is what we found out when we turned to the Israelis. We wanted to see what makes them proud. So we discovered variations of Israeli diversity. We wanted to see what are the values that they're willing to celebrate in consensus. So you can see it's about ability, the, the notion of family and home, mutual trust. It's the warmth, the openness, the togetherness. They love their military might, they love their technology, they love their history, they're very proud of their ethnic diversity. By and large, when you ask Israelis, how do you see yourself, this is what you get. Israelis think of themselves as Western, modern, technologically advanced. They think, as my son says, that they're very cool. Yeah. <laughs> but what is it that Israel communicates to the world? What is it that you see here when you turn on your TV set, when you go online? What is it that you see? Do you see that or this? This is what the world sees. The world sees one side that has the military might and the other side who's perceived as the underdog. And the tank is trying to convince the world that the boy is a threat. That's what we're trying to do. Now, if you will give me enough time, preferably a full academic semester, I will be able to make, I believe, a very compelling, convincing argument that the tank in this equation, historically, legally, and morally, is indeed the victim. I can make that argument. But in today's world, where the average attention span on the part of the media consumer is around three seconds, that's the amount of time we're given by the consumer. Uh, my ability to make that heavily historical argument is very limited. So what is the solution? While we can't make this go away, this is a very prominent feature in our daily lives. The conflict is a real thing. No one is trying or no one can make it go away in terms of the public awareness. It is so visible and so prominent in public discourse. But what we can do, and in fact we have to do if we want to be able to compete, 
is to make sure that this does not remain the only conversation about Israel. That this is not the only thing that defines Israel to the world. Israel is more than the conflict with its neighbors. And there are many other prisms through which we can and should celebrate Israel to the world. Each and every one of them represents a different relative advantage of the state of Israel. It can be from the international aid programs that Raslan was talking about, to the environment, Israel's advanced clean tech. It can be culture and the arts, it can be sports. How many of you know that Israel won the European Championship in basketball five times? You can imagine a tiny country of less than eight million people defeating nations like Russia or Germany or Italy in basketball. We did it five times in our history. How many people know that? Very few. And of course, Israel's advancement in the field of medical breakthroughs and infrastructure and sightseeing and lifestyle and leisure and wine and so on. And here you have a far more accurate depiction of life in Israel. The conflict is still in the picture. In fact, it's still in the heart of the picture, the very center of the picture. But the conflict is not the only thing that defines Israel to the world. It's one of many things. And each and every one of them has to reflect a real relative advantage that we possess. They say this story about this guy who's going down the street, runs into an old friend. <coughs> and he sees much to his amazement that the friend has a penguin marching behind him. That penguin. He says to him, hey, you know there's a penguin behind you? The friend says, yes, of course I know there's a penguin behind you. <laughs> so what are you going to do about the penguin? I suggest you take the penguin right away to the nearest zoo. The friend says, it's a great idea. The next day, he runs into the same friend again, and he sees the same penguin marching behind him. He says to him, hey, didn't I tell you to take him to the zoo yesterday? He said, yeah. Yesterday we went to the zoo, today we're going to the movies. <laughs> <laughs> it's not about what we say. It's about what they hear. Human beings have this peculiar tendency of taking information and processing this information through a very individual and personal filter, emotional filter. So two people can be exposed to the same text. Each will draw a different conclusion from it. We have to understand that in the process of country branding. And the conclusion we draw from this story about the penguin that it's not about winning a debate. It's not about the ability to transmit a message unilaterally to an audience. It's about building relationships with people that are meaningful, relationships that are relevant. If you're unable to do that, whether you're an institution like Wharton School of Business, or a government like the government of Croatia, it's going to be extremely difficult, if not impossible, to improve your overall positioning. One perfect example of a country that wasn't able to do that is, of course, what I call the most interesting and the most compelling story in the field of country, country positioning of late. You know this guy? <laughs> Sasha Baron Cohen woke up one morning and said to himself, I'm going to take one country, a real country, with real people. Incidentally, that country is a very wealthy country with natural resources. It's 120 times the size of the state of Israel, by the way. With millions of citizens, with a history and tradition that dates thousands of years. And I'm going to single-handedly, with no help, change their image completely. <laughs> That's what he said. And he said, I'm going to present this country as the most bizarre nation on earth. <laughs> and he created this character called Bora. Now, let me tell you, Sasha Baron Cohen and the movie Bora, three facts you didn't know about. First of all, Bora is not a Kazakh name. <laughs> Bora is a Turkish name. Second, the movie Bora was shot in its entirety in Romania and in the United States. <laughs> Sasha Baron Cohen, and that's the third fact, never set foot in his life in Kazakhstan. Yet, 
is the world's most famous Kazakh. <laughs> That's the power of Hollywood. That's the power of country positioning. Now I'm asking you, why was he able to do that so easily? Tell me. Who can tell me? Why was he able to do that so easily? Because Kazakhstan did not define its own brand in a proactive fashion. We knew nothing on Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan was not even on our radar. Because we knew nothing about Kazakhstan, we were willing to buy anything and everything Sasha Baron Cohen will tell us about them. For example, that his sister is the fourth most famous prostitute in all of Kazakhstan. And things of that nature. You know, I don't want to go into the rest of the details of that. I want to have, by the way, half the movies in Hebrew, those of you who don't know. It's a very funny, very funny movie. But the point is, brand capital is an integral part of your national security. Whether you're England or Israel or Lebanon, it doesn't matter. Brand capital, your image, the strength of your image, if you will not manage your image the same way Kazakhstan did, You'll be a sitting duck, <laughs> allowing your competition to define you. And country positioning is never about your competition. Country positioning is about what you are offering to the consumer. <coughs> New York is about what New York is offering the consumer. New York is not about what Philadelphia is not offering. And the right way to think about it is to think about my own competitive edge. Define to yourself what is it that you're good at and then communicate that effectively to relevant audiences. That's the whole secret. Oh, by the way, I wanted to show you a movie. And not a movie, a video. So we said, remember I showed you that question mark? We set out to explore if Las Vegas is about sin, and Brazil is about fun, then Israel is about what? So one of the things that we did several years ago, we conducted a series of focus groups in 30 different locations in the United States. And we wanted to know what is it that people feel when the word Israel is, is thrown at them. And the way we did it, we uh, brought together people, not Jewish, people that have at least one college degree, and that earn money above average, at the time it was, I believe, $37,000 GDP per capita per annum. And the instructor walked into the room. They were told that they were coming to discuss America and the world. None of them knew that Israel was behind the exercise. And the instructor, the moderator, asked them to throw names of countries that come to mind, what we call in the research language, top of mind countries. So she said to them, please, tell me the first country that comes to your mind. So people said Mexico, Italy, England, Scotland. She wrote them down. I can tell you in parentheses, it's not important, but just so that you will know, Israel rarely came up unaided. In other words, she had to help them to say the word Israel. But she had to have the word Israel in there because if Israel was not there, there was no exercise. So after she collected 30 or 40 names of countries, she then turned to the group and told them, we're going to play a game. The game is called the house party game. I want you to imagine that you're somewhere in the heartland, in a small town, and you have homes scattered around. Each home, she says, represents a different nation from our list. And there's a party in this home, and you're all invited <coughs> to participate in the party. What I want you to do as a group is describe to me the first party we're going into. Let's say the first party we go into is Italy's party, okay? So let me just show you. We'll start with one minute video, <coughs> which describes the Italian party, and then I will make a stop and then we'll continue. So let's see what these people have to say about Italy's house. The Italian party, um, focus groups. I'm just giving you a couple of examples. Party, 
party. Yeah. I say you're four because you feel relaxed. Yeah. 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 For a while. Weeks. Now, what are we going to be doing over there? Eating. 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 Ten. Ten. These people are very attracted to Italy. What did we learn from this exercise about their feelings toward Italy? Please, tell me. Familiar. It's, first of all, it's familiar. What else? It's pleasant, right? It's about warmth. They describe human beings. Italy is what? The Italian experience is what? Emotional. 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 Very emotional. Family. Very what? Family oriented. Family oriented, it's about food and wine and playing cards and they're able to describe activities and they're able to describe people. So for 10 minutes, we spend with the group time in Italy's house and then the instructor says to the group, okay guys, it's time to move on. We're crossing the street over to the Indian house or the Belgian house, whatever. Every, every group is a different house. Another house, another house. Usually the fourth or the fifth house before they get tired is Israel's house. Pay attention, please, to what these people have to say about Israel's house. What you're going to see now is a two and a half minute video. It's a compilation of seven groups. Some of the video footage is very broken into seconds and split seconds, but pay attention to the subtitles. And I want you to pay attention to their description of the party in Israel's house. And bear in mind two things. They have no idea whatsoever that we're behind it, so they're being 100% candid. And again, they were asked to describe a party. Israel's house. Two and a half minutes. We're standing outside Israel's house. Looking at, what do we see? I don't know what it was. I'm picturing what I see over there on TV, cement. Plain cement. How many people are living there? I say probably about four. Is there a lawn? No. 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 A lot of concrete. Not very attractive. I don't think I would, because I, I picture very orthodox house. So would you? I don't know. If, I don't know if we can be welcome. Really? Depending, because there's certain yeah. certain depending on the religion, you know. Certain Orthodox, you can't even enter the house unless you're a certain type. It's just the way their belief system is. So I don't even know if we'd be invited. That just makes it dangerous, too, just because all that's going on over there. Yeah. 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 So who greets us at the door? The husband. The husband. Yeah, the husband. Yeah. 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 Is there a guy who's <laughs> Strict. Do they see you, please? Uncomfortable. It's a culture. So we spent more or less time than we did in Japan. Less. Less? Less? Okay. So, uh, while we're leaving, what are we thinking? We'll go ahead right out of there. Hope <laughs> we got safe. Yeah. Okay. Is there anything colorful about this at all? No. no. <laughs> you can even see the house is just this giant roof with spikes on top of it. I think it's like more for a protection. Like, it's for To keep people out. Has big gates, four okay. five bars, and uh, I don't know, windows and whatnot. Probably one story. It's a bunker? Okay. Let's say that there was a, a neighborhood block party that was going on. Would all families go? Do you think? No. I don't think Some, why would you go? Father would go just to see, you know. But I, I think I don't. I don't think he'd allow the children. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, or maybe not even the wife. I just get a feeling that they're very defensive and very closed off, protected. There are people who just like to be left alone. Yeah. And not switch towards others. I think you're expecting some kind of tension. I don't know what to expect more from Israel's house than I do from France's and, and India's. We don't want to stay there that long. Yeah? No. It feels healthy. Are you feeling yeah. healthy? I'm not. No? What are you feeling? I'm, uh, I don't know. wonder if they'll accept me. Yeah, how about? Skin color. Apprehensive. Feel like, relieved leaving, actually. Feel relieved leaving actually says the last person 
and sums it all up. Let me ask you the same question I asked you about Italy's house. On a scale of one to ten, what would you say? What's, what? Negative five. <laughs> Don't be so harsh on us. Negative two is bad. <laughs> Negative two, pretty bad. These people clearly are not attracted to Israel. Right? They had no idea we were behind it. They were 100% candid. And we know these people, American people with at least one college degree and income above average, are not attracted to Israel. Not only that, there was one guy right before the end, an African American, who says, I fear the Israelis will not accept me because of my skin color. Not even knowing that we have black Israelis. <laughs> that Israel made an extreme effort to bring in tens of thousands of Jews from Ethiopia with the help of American Jews. Unprecedented. What other country is bringing people from Africa as legal immigrants? He had no idea. Now, before I tell you the punchline of this, let me tell you what, was the, what were the findings. Because remember, we conducted 30 focus groups, and I just showed you, you know, a compilation of several groups. First of all, the one thing that we learned is that Israel's house was unique. Of all the countries we collected information about, Israel's house is very unique in the sense it's the only house that is made out of concrete. <laughs> in fact, the word concrete or cement comes up in every group. The second thing that we learned is that Israel's house is the only house where participants are unable to describe the house while using colors. No colors in Israel's house, they talk about dirt, dust, no colors. No green, no blue, no red, no yellow. Israel's house is the only house where consistently we are unable to receive descriptions of the interior. People have no idea how an Israeli house may look like on the inside. And the worst thing, the most disturbing thing, is that in all 30 focus groups, we did not receive not even one description of an Israeli woman. No women in Israel's house. Only men, they're armed, they're angry, they're upset for some reason, they're sitting outside the house and they do not wish to let you in. This was the summary of Israel. I'm sorry. This was what we got. Bottom line was Israel is a strict, unwelcoming entity, and the verdict of the American consumer was Israel is not fun. That's a damning verdict, believe me, if you're a brand. If you're not fun, you're in big trouble. If the consumer doesn't think that he can celebrate with you, have a party with you, you're in big trouble. Whether you're in Philadelphia or Miami, it doesn't matter. Now the interesting thing is, and if there's one thing I'd like you to remember from this presentation, is the point I'm about to make. We then ask them, you know, the Israelis are engaged in a conflict with their neighbors. I'm sure you've heard of it. I'm just interested, the instructor said, in the conflict between Israel and its adversaries. Who do you support? That was the question. Now I'm asking you, how many of you think that the people that you just saw on the screen were more supportive of Israel in the conflict? Please raise your hand. Okay, about 15, 20% of the people in the room. How many of you think that the people on the screen that you just saw were more supportive of the Palestinians? Please raise your hand. Okay, so even less, 10% think also. So. so we have about 70% of the people in the room undecided. So let me solve the mystery for you. It turns out that the very same people you just saw on the screen that described Israel as the most unattractive place on the, first of the, on the face of this earth. When it comes to the conflict between Israel and its neighbors, tend to support Israel at a ratio of seven to one. 
which is, by the way, consistent with any other research that was done on this subject in the last 25 years. Americans support Israel overwhelmingly. But I'm asking you, in the spirit of country positioning, they support Israeli policies, but what are the chances these people will ever do business with us? What are the chances these people will ever travel to visit us? What are the chances these people will voluntarily expose themselves to Israeli culture, Israeli film, Israeli dance, Israeli literature? And of course the answer is slim to none. So if there's one thing I want you to remember from this presentation is that in country positioning, you must not make assumptions. That if people support you politically, you can mobilize them to behave on your behalf. Wrong assumption. The last five winners in the Nobel Prize in Economics won the prize because they were able to prove beyond any doubt that human beings are very complex creatures. They can agree with you intellectually and dislike you emotionally. They can disagree with you intellectually and be attracted to you immensely. Human beings can do that. They do not necessarily have to be rational. So the American people support Israeli policies, but their understanding of Israel's personality is that Israel is not for me. It's not fun. And by the way, Israel is not the only country American people feel that way. But just so happened I work for Israel, and I'd like to fix that situation. By the way, after we did that uh, exercise, the instructor put a pile of old magazines on the, ta on the table and asked them to take scissors and cut out the images of what they will go, what, what they will see in Israel when they will go there. So this is what people, I'm just showing you samples of the kind of images that people clip from the magazines. Israel is all about war and conflict, some religiosity, and a little bit of desert. That's Israel in the eyes of the well-educated American. This is not a joke. This is a real thing. And when you check Israel's core meaning, this is from a study that covered 13,000 13, Americans. You look at the top, the associations that define Israel's meaning, core meaning, in the eyes of the American people. So you can see daring, independent, original, rugged, traditional, intelligent, unique, leader, arrogant, straightforward, <coughs> unapproachable. The guy who did the study told us, you know what, it's not a bad place to be in. Americans think that you're tough and smart leader. You have leadership qualities, but you're tough and smart. But he said, if I were you, I would not be concerned with what you see up there. I'd be concerned with what you're not. Look at what you're not. You're not stylish, you're not fun, you're not good value, you're not high quality, you're not worth more, you're not carefree, you're not charming, you're not trendy, and you're not healthy. And that's very bad news. So what do you do? And I will not bore you with the details of the rest of our research, but I'll just show you a little bit of the solution. So what do you do? You identify through research. What are the niche conversations that you can engage with, with people all over the world, that are meaningful and beneficial to both sides? What are the areas in which we're good at that are relevant to you, the consumer? And we identify through research six relative advantages. We call them the six pillars. Six different conversations we'd like to be engaged in. Right now, there's only one conversation overshadowing everything. But we would like this to be the conversation. We call it the Israeli Creative Spirit Menu. You can see, Israel has a lot to offer in the field of the environment. From water desalination to water management, we have a lot to offer in the field of Desert agriculture. In fact, Israel is a world leader in desert agriculture. We have a lot to offer in the field of lifestyle, from fashion and food, wine, architecture, design, and so on. 
the people, the diversity of the Israeli people, you just heard from at the Ruz, Deputy Consul General. We have many other groups represented in Israeli society. I myself am from a Yemenite tradition. Uh, and you have, you know, most Americans don't even know that we had Jews in Yemen. Uh, but of course, high tech and technology is the uh, very powerful conversation we title as the Startup Nation conversation. Uh, uh, culture and the arts is a no brainer, and of course, uh, Rastan already talked about Israel's international aid programs. This is the celebration we'd like to be engaged in. A discussion that doesn't shy away from the conflict and from Israel's political problems, but actually highlights Israel's positive aspects. In their own words, I will not show you what Madonna said, but let me conclude with the words of Warren Buffett when he was asked about Israel. Today, I'd like to first congratulate Donna Bradstreet uh, on selecting uh, Steph Wertheimer for the uh, Longstanding Leadership Excellence Award. Uh, uh, they couldn't have made a, a better choice, and it's particularly impressive uh, when someone is chosen for that award uh, in Israel because the uh, level of competition uh, and the talent level available is, is, is so high. It's one thing to win in some other countries, but uh, uh, as I said when I went to Israel a few months back, uh, if you go to the Middle East looking for oil, you don't need to stop in Israel. But if you're looking for for brains, for energy, for integrity, for imagination, it's the only stop you need to make. And nobody uh, personifies those qualities. If you're, looking for, if you're looking for brains, for imagination, for integrity, it's the only stop you need to make. It's not coming from us. It's coming from uh, Warren Buffett. And of course, uh, you know, I'd like to say one last word about the strength of Tel Aviv as a brand. Tel Aviv has a very powerful strategy called Young Stop. To those of you who've been to Tel Aviv, experience the intensity of the place Tel Aviv. But Tel Aviv today is emerging as Israel's leading sub-brand. The brand that can carry the entire super brand on its back. And let me conclude with a little story that will shed some more light as to the question of why countries engage in this effort of country positioning. And they tell the story about Golda Meir, our prime minister between the years 69 to 74. Golda Meir, back in 1972, was asked to host a German chancellor, whose name was Willy Brandt in Israel. And someone wisely advised Golda, if you want to impress Willy Brandt, take him on a tour of German architecture in Tel Aviv. I don't know how many of you know that, but Tel Aviv has 4,000 Bauhaus buildings. And she did. She showed him some Bauhaus buildings in Tel Aviv, and they concluded the tour, if you know Tel Aviv, at the Habima Square, where we have our National Theater, and she showed in the village, she said, this is our Habima building, our National Theater, and right next to it, she said, is the Man Auditorium, our performing arts center. And Willy Brandt said, oh my God, I can't believe you, the Israelis, made the decision to name your own performing arts center after the famous German author, Thomas Mann? <laughs> and she said, no, 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 no. Yeah. We named it after Freddie Mann from Philadelphia. <laughs> said Freddie Mann from Philadelphia? Never heard of him, what did he write? She looked at him and she said he wrote a check. <laughs> <laughs> There's a tough competition out there. The competition is between nations and cities. And places that will not be able to be attractive, that will not celebrate their attractive dimensions, will lose the ability to compete. And when you lose the ability to compete, you look like Detroit. <laughs> when you lose the ability to complete, you look like places that are depressed, under-maintained, and cannot be celebrated by the consumer. And I say Detroit, no, not jokingly, because Detroit is really struggling nowadays. And Detroit has great assets. But what do you do when you have such a terrible situation of economic depression? It's a real problem. And we had places like my hometown, Cologne, that struggled with the same thing, economic depression, that lost the ability to compete. And what Cologne did, Cologne invented its own competitive edge. And they said, we are going to reinvent ourselves as Israel's city of children. And with this optimistic note, I'd like to open the discussion for your questions. Thank you so much.
Yes. Do you cooperate in any way with birthright? Well, you know, this, um, if I cooperate in any way with birthright, it's a good question. Birthright is one of the most important things that are happening in the field of soft power today. Uh, in the world, I think it's the most important project in Jewish life. Uh, every Israeli participant in birthright goes through this presentation only in Hebrew. Uh, so to that extent, we, we do cooperate with birthright, but birthright is not officially part of what we do. You have to know that the brand Israel program doesn't really have uh, a structure. It's more of a mindset. It's like I Love New York. I Love New York was not an organization, it's a mindset. The Big Apple is not an organization, it's a concept. So same thing, we want people to be able to understand that what is needed, if you care about the product, if you don't care about the product, I have no problem. But if you care about the product, if you care about Israel and you want to help, what you need to do is help us to broaden the conversation. If you don't care, it's fine, it's perfectly fine. But our job is to broaden the conversation, yes please. So countries like Croatia and Spain that you say have changed their corporate brand, they, they, when, you, when you portrayed them at first, they were like Spain was not, Spain was a dictatorship in Croatia. I don't know what exactly their political situation was, but it was a democracy like it is now, and that's changed. So effectively, that's what we had been hearing about was what was going on bad there. And I guess what I'm going to ask is, What's, what's going on bad there has stopped. And how can Israel possibly resurrect, how can Israel possibly create a positive brand when it still has all this negative publicity? Excellent question. Like, like, like those countries were getting because of their actual events rather than their perception. Right. It's, it's an excellent question. In branding in general, uh, you have to make a decision if how much energy you're going to spend on crisis management. Uh, we came to the conclusion that the crisis is so deep and so real and so not marginal that we can never have the luxury of waiting for the crisis to resolve itself. We asked ourselves a very special, a very simple question. As civil servants, I'm not a decision maker, I'm not a politician, I'm, I'm a civil servant. And I asked myself, do I have the luxury of waiting for the crisis to end. Of course, if tomorrow peace will strike, this will be a lot easier for me to accomplish. But what if peace will not strike for the next 300 years? Do I have the luxury of waiting? Do I have the luxury of allowing my competition to define me only by my deficiencies? I don't have that luxury. Ask Kazakhstan, they'll tell you. It's a luxury. We don't have the luxury. So we say, you're right. I wish I could have announced today that we solved all the problems in the Middle East. But unfortunately, it's not the case. So given the problems, we say we could still do a lot better. When we started this program, we were happy to bring one and a half million tourists to Israel. This was 2002. Less than that, because it was the Intifada. Today, we have 3.8 million tourists, with all the problems, with all the so-called Arab Spring. It shows you when you do work and when you do invest in niche markets, you see the results. And next year, we're going to break the record. We're going to have more than 4 million tourists. And that's only one indication. There's an index called the Country Brand Index, maintained by future brands out of England. Israel is going up every year. This year, we're at number 28. I urge all of you to go online and look at their methodology. It's a fascinating index. We had nothing to do with this research. Every year, Israel is climbing up. We started at 112. Today, we're number 28. And this happened in less than a decade. There's a lot more work to be done. It's a monumental task. It will take us at least, at least a generation to change the overall positioning. It took New York City 25 years. It took Spain 15 years. It took England 10 years. And Ireland 15 years. More questions, yes. Um, so when you interviewed these people, or, or this, when the study was made, there was, you said there's a seven to one ratio, but at the same time, most of the people didn't know enough about Israel um, to 
and, and they just make sort of, of judgments of what they saw in the media and what they hear about it, right? So obviously bad news spread quicker than good news. So how do you target, I mean, I understand that the seven to one ratio, the seven people, um, they're, even since they're pro-Israel, they're gonna hear some good news about it and you know, they're gonna follow it, but how do you target that one person who is the hater? And, and in, for example, in the video, maybe it was the woman who said, I felt I, I would be kicked out by the Orthodox people because I wouldn't be dressed appropriately. How do you target that person who's a hater? She's always gonna find us somehow as a bad person. When we're a victim, they're gonna find us as, as taking over the land, and now that we're kicking out the Palestinians, they find us as tyrants. So they're always gonna find an excuse against us. How do you target? Uh, I know it usually stands against human nature to look at the source of agitation, the person who is saying the most offensive things to you. You said the one person who was the hater. I don't know if she's a hater, but she's a very critical person. <coughs> so our natural tendency is to respond directly to the source of agitation. That's what human beings do. And in marketing, there's no biggest, bigger mistake. No bigger mistake. What are the chances you'll be able to convert someone like Noam Chomsky and turn him into your big fan? Awesome. Zero, right? So why spend energy on him? You have 95% of the students on campus that not only don't care about Israel, they have no idea what Israel is all about. Our job is to tell them, you can disagree with us, it's fine. You know, many Israelis disagree with Israel. You know, I, I live in New York. People, especially New York Jews, complain about the New York Times all the time. They say, oh, it's a terrible newspaper. They write bad things about Israel all the time. I tell them, wait until you read Israeli paper. Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> it's the most critical newspaper of Israel in the whole world. And it's an Israeli newspaper. And that's fine. We're not afraid of criticism. It's OK for people to disagree with their governments or with someone else's <coughs> government. It's perfectly fine. We're talking about something entirely different. And this is what I meant when I said, there's one lesson I'd like you to remember from this whole presentation, is that human beings can live perfectly well with the disconnect between the rational and the emotional. And if you understand that, you have the key to be a successful marketer. Yes, please, Mr. Shani. Uh, two, two last questions, okay, because people would like to go home and we have I'll, I'll stay here to answer some more questions. Yes, please, you wanted to ask something in the back. Yeah, I was wondering what relationship uh, you and your organization have with groups like Stand With Us and, and, and pro-Israel fund you know, groups that, that promote Israel on campuses in the U.S. How, how do you communicate the message? How do you do that? Look, how do you get we, into line, et cetera? Yeah. The nature of the uh, of communal life, Jewish community life in America is that there is no one coherent structure. So you have groups here and there. And so the only thing I can do is to inform the others what I do, and the way I do it is by sharing research with them. By the way, I'm willing to share research with anybody, a Jew, a non-Jew, uh, churches, synagogues. Why? Because our assumption is very simple. There's nothing secretive about our research, and people that care about Israel will be interested in it. People that don't care will simply won't be interested in it. So if you ask me about groups like Stand With Us, we try to inform them. We don't have, you know, they're not part of our program more than any, more than any other group. And they invite us to speak. We come and do our best. Uh, but uh, we don't have, uh, you know, and our, my organization is actually a network of Israeli consulates here in North America. So we have nine offices here in North America, two offices in Canada. And we do our best with a very small staff with a shoestring budget. We'll take one last question. Yes, please. Um, I guess sort of the pessimist in me is like I need to ask the brands and companies that suffer setbacks to their images of brand and never recover. And so I guess my question is, why do you believe that Israel as a brand that has really suffered setbacks but is able to recover from its image issues? And I guess in the vein of what you said about Cologne, what, what can Israel do <laughs> I'll start with your second question. Well, it's not just this one. Every, every place, every country, if you want to be successful, you have to improve your performance. It's not about designing a logo. So how do you improve performance? 
You invest in infrastructure. You build more museums. You build more attractions for tourists. You, you make life better life for your own people. Country positioning is in the first place about the stakeholders, the people that own the brand, the Israelis themselves. In New York, if, so your first question, what makes me, what gives me the reason to believe that Israel will be able to survive all the setbacks, right? That was your question. Well, the answer is the story of the city of New York. New York is my personal inspiration and my professional inspiration. New York was on the verge of bankruptcy in the early 70s. Terrible economic situation. New York was synonymous with crime and with police corruption. In 25 years, New York completely changed its overall position. And New York did it with no money. And New York did it from a terrible place of economic depression. Israel's economic situation is far better today than New York's economic situation back in 75 when President Ford told them drop that. So if you're interested in knowing how it can be done, and I'll end with that, I urge all of you to go to the library and to read a book titled The Branding of New York, written by an American sociologist whose name is Miriam Greenberg. It's actually a sociology slash history book about the process that saved the city of New York from bankruptcy. And if you will read that and you'll see if New York was able to do that, if they were able to get out of the hole they were in, Israel can do it easy. Thank you so much.